So we'll probably start the recording from here. We have a very, very special guest tonight. Somebody I call my little brother. Somebody calls him daddy. <laughs> he's a brother. He's a son. He is so much. But let me give you his formal introduction. You guys are really in for a treat today. The reason I call him my little brother is I have known him since undergrad. He was a few years behind me. We went through the same undergrad, went through the same medical school. Then he went off and did big things. <laughs> so let me share his formal bio with you. And then we're going to kick it off. And I have a question for you before you share your career journey. I don't know if you're ready for it, but I, I know it's going to make you laugh. <laughs> uh -oh. So Dr. Akwesi, uh, I'm from Sa, am I pronouncing that right? Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. Aponsa is a board certified interventional pain management consultant and anesthesiologist currently practicing in New Jersey, which is where we went to undergrad and med school. He is the head of neuromodulation and upcoming program director for the interventional pain medicine fellowship program at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. Formerly the program director at University of Miami's pain medicine fellowship program. Dr. Amponsa has nearly a decade of experience in treating complex chronic pain syndromes, both in the academic as well as private sectors. He specializes in axial spine and nerve pain, utilizing advanced interventional pain techniques, such as spinal cord stimulation, intrathecal drug delivery systems, kyphoplasty, and minimally invasive spine and joint procedures. <laughs> he is an avid soccer player, very good Ghanaian, <laughs> and an active father to a six-year-old girl. So very impressive bio. But the question I want to, so welcome. Dr. Thank you. <laughs> the question I want to ask you for the audience is, where did you get the name Styling Doc? Why did you get Tell us about that. Where are the origins of <laughs> That's funny. Well, thank you, Fran, for that generous introduction. Uh, welcome, folks, uh, who, those who are able to join us and those who are not, you get a chance to see this later. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. This name, Style and Doc. Style and Doc is just a, a company that I have on the side that makes white coats and scrubs and uh, accessories and stuff like that. It's very simple because I uh, I was always into style and fashion and um, I was a physician and I never liked how the stuff they gave us in the hospitals fit. You know, the scrub, they like the, they look very cheap. The garments were very, you know, ill-fitting. The white coats are dro drooping off you. The scrubs are oversized. So I figured, you know what, why not make something that's more fashion fashionable that our people would want to wear? And, and the name just kind of came out of it, you know, style, fashion, and being a physician, boom. So not just a doctor, an entrepreneur. I love that. Everybody we've had on so far is more than just a doctor. And I love the different journeys you've all had. So with that said, please, I'm going to take myself off the screen so it can be all about you. Tell us about your journey. How did you get to where you are? How did you go beyond just being a styling doc in the practice of interventional um, pain management that you're in? Yeah. So let's take, I'm going to take you back to Ghana. I was born and raised in Kumasi and I did all my primary studies there. And then I came to the U.S. and I matriculated in college here in New Jersey at Rutgers. And through there, that's where I met Fran and continued pursuing my medical studies at Rutgers, did my anesthesia residency at Rutgers as well. And as an undergrad, I had, there was a program that allowed us to be able to sample some medical school courses and allow us early access and I did that program. So I was fortunate enough to be able to get access into and granted admission to the medical school during my junior year in college. And then I went ahead, finished med school at Rutgers, stayed at Rutgers for anesthesia. And then I went to Manhattan, New York City for my an extra year of my interventional pain fellowships. So the anesthesia residency program is a three-year program, core program, but you also need to do a one-year preliminary uh, year either in medicine tra transitional year or surgery after that one year then you do your three years of clinical anesthesia residency training and after you're done with that you have a few available subspecialty or first fellowship programs pain management or pain medicine being one of them and that's what i did so after your year 
three year, three four year training of anesthesia, you can do an extra year of fellowship, which is what I did in, in management. After that, I went into private practice for a year in Manhattan, and then I went for from Miami from my, uh, New York. I moved to Miami, and I lived and worked in Miami for about six or so years. Um, in academics, I worked in the Miami VA Veterans Hospital as well as the University of Miami. And I've always been very interested in academic medicine and clinical research and sort of putting, pushing our specialty forward. But what was more important to me was um, not seeing black and brown folks in leadership positions throughout my medical school training and my clinical training, you know. And I always wondered why we have such excellent clinicians, why we are not in gatekeeper positions, what I call it, you know. Um, so I, in academic medicine, I said, you know, well, well, I do pain management. How can I get into a leadership position in pain management? And, uh, you know, the fellowship was something I was just interested in. I said, well, it will help me. I can help pick which fellows, help train them and put them out there and hopefully level the playing field, get some quality physicians, women, minorities, so on and so forth, and not just have the field be one-sided. So I was uh, appointed the program director in the Pell Fellowship in the University of Miami, and I did that for a while before coming to New Jersey. And I carried the same sentiment when I got here in New Jersey. It was more like a full circle because I started at Rutgers, and I ended up back here at Rutgers in Newark, which is a very inner-city metropolitan area. And I, again, expressed my interest in academic medicine. And I was very shocked that I was probably the only Black physician, the only Black male pain doctor, right. only Black pain doctor, period, that they've had ever since the service was created. And uh, it didn't make sense to me because Newark is about like 90% Blacks and Hispanics. So nothing that was in a division or a department, especially in pain management, was anywhere Brown or Black. And that didn't sit well, well with me. So I, again saw interest in the F pain fellowship program and I got appointed as the current so I'm the current program director in the fellowship and luckily today was our match so today was my first match and I matched a very uh, exciting candidate so they're going to train with us for a year and now I do uh, pain management and also anesthesia at this level one trauma center here in Newark um, I spend most of my time doing clinical pain management in the office outpatient setting. So I see patients in an office-based uh, practice setting, and then I do procedures, some in the office, some in the, on the x-ray in the hospital, and some on the general anesthesia when I'm doing um, some major spine surgery uh, procedures. Um, I, I enjoy spending time out of the ORs and if I'm not on call, playing soccer and taking care of my little girl. So essentially that's... Well, um, what, my, what my story is, I've always been a fan of GPSF. I was introduced to GPSF by Fran. So, so Fran just kind of drags me around wherever she goes. Um, and clearly I follow her around because she knows what she's, she's talking about, where she's going. So um, yeah, we've maintained this big sister, little bro relationship for many years. And she brought me to the organization and I've been here since ever since. I'm very passionate about moving Ghana medicine forward and helping our colleagues, especially the IMGs, try to get some leverage. Um, it will be good for us. It'll be good for, good for Ghana. So that's my story. Awesome. You've had quite the journey and have taken on a lot of leadership roles, which I think it's so very important. Um, not everybody's meant to be a leader. So tell us, what are some of the things that you did to prepare yourself for these leadership roles that you've taken on? Um, I think the biggest thing is um, losing fear of criticism. Um, as a leader, you can't please everyone. You're going to get criticized whether you're right, you're going to get criticized whether you're presumably wrong or whether you're flat, flat out wrong. Um, everybody's going to come with varying opinions on how you should lead or, or so on and so forth. Um, and you have to be willing to be open-minded and not be afraid if you make a mistake that people are going to talk about you. So I got rid of that early on, um, um, not being afraid to be criticized. Um, and I think it, 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 it makes you... It, develop, it helps you develop a hardy personality. Um, of course, the basic stuff that we do already have as physicians and as medical practitioners in training, you know, being on time and being courteous and knowing how to, you know, read and write well and so on and so forth and speaking well and so on and so forth. But a couple of things I've also done, though, is invest in myself. Yeah. Um, remember, we, we imagine if you, if you train in the U.S., you know this painfully. We're spending hundreds of thousands investing in our education. Why? Because we know we can be a valuable per asset 
to ourselves, our family, our community, and so on and so forth. But also we're going to get, you know, well compensated and blah, blah, blah. To be a good leader, I think uh, the things that you have to invest in, like self-development. So I listen to a lot of audio books on self-development, audio books on public speaking, uh, uh, and those kind of things. And I think it makes an immense impact on how I view myself and you project that outward, you know, and whether you're, I'm a speaking to medical students or whether I'm speaking at a board meeting is that you have the same sort of presentation. Very nice. So audiobooks, I love audiobooks. I think yeah, it's just such an... So time consuming. So time, you know, it's saving. Exactly. Right? Listen to it while you're driving in and everywhere. Exactly. I'll be baking in the kitchen, listening to audiobooks, <laughs> driving in the car, listen to audiobooks. So I'm a huge fan of audiobooks. It's efficient use of your time, like you said. Yeah. Tell us some of the suggested books that you would have us read to be better leaders. Uh, one of the books I just recently finished was um, As a Man Think It. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very groundbreaking book on like essentially self-development and psychology and how, you know, our, our work projection, our environment is just a direct reflection of everything that we think upstairs. And so essentially it's like a self-mastery book, you know, how to get your goals accomplished, how to get to anywhere you want to be by just practically, literally thinking it into existence. I'm a big law of attraction kind of guy. So I listen to a lot of those kind of books and, you know, uh, 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 you know, designing and curating your life, how you want it to be. Um, what else? Um, yeah, essentially those, those kind of self-help books. I listen to them all. Oh, the gurus, you know, the, uh, the, the most common folks. And I listen to a lot of podcasts too. Uh, Ducks Outside the Box, box is, a, is a gentleman, knee, Dr. Nee Dark, on one of our own. Um, he has a, a, an amazing podcast. Every chance I get, I plug it in, I plug it in, I plug it in. Um, yeah, so all platforms, Docs Outside the Box, you know, Apple, whatever, you can just log on. If you're a medical student, there's always something on there, you know. It's so many. I don't even know how he finds time to do this, but there's so many gems on there. Whenever I have free time, I just tap it, go through the library, tap into one and just listen, you know. So that's something that for the IMGs, if you're not familiar with, it's something that will give you a lot of insight on, being a physician in the U.S. and even practice, lifestyles, tax, a lot of stuff. I love that you plugged Nini. Nee. Nee was our guest last month. Yeah, yeah. I know he was on here not long ago. Yeah, he talked about the docs. In the, I'm going to tell him that you plugged his show. He's going to love that. <laughs> <was> like that. <laughs> that is awesome. There's a question in the um, Q&A, and I'll read it to you. But before we, I get to that, Tell us a little bit more about what GPSF is trying to do um, for the IMGs. I know you recently took on the mantle of leading those efforts, and we thank you for that. It's a very, very important thing, something that we're very interested in helping our um, residents, our students, anybody who's interested in getting additional help to navigate the U.S. system um, and navigate their career. That's why we're doing this career series. That's why we're providing the initiatives that you're now leading. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's something that has been very near and dear to my heart. You know, I have a brother here who finally, by the grace of God, got into residency. He trained at K Nust in, in, in Kumasi and, and UMG, and he tried twice. Now, finally, got into medical uh, internal medicine. It, 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 it breaks my heart that our colleagues back home, who are just as bright, if not brighter, go through medical school, go through residency, housemanship, all this stuff, and then they get stuck behind a system that won't allow them to flourish. You know, yeah. won't allow them to thrive. And they're, they're stuck and there's nothing they can do, right? And it's sort of like the few that are lucky will apply abroad and get into various areas, Cuba, Russia, wherever, and U.S. if they're very lucky and go train. At that point, they're exhausted and a lot of them probably don't even want to go back and you can't blame them, right? Um, why go back to a system that seemingly did everything to sort of like prevent you from thriving? So I, I, I was wondering like, how can we sort of those of us that made it to the, that crossed the bridge to the other side how can we lean reach back because that's the whole premise of gpsf is to, is to bridge the gap the you yeah. those of us in the diaspora and those who are back home just find ways to to collaborate and, and and thrive together you know so well we need to get folks to the attendant level before we can even reach and collaborate whatever they got to make it right you can't be talking to, to someone who's trying to get past you know, training and get attending level, you can't be talking to them about your development and what you want to do, and they can't even get up underneath the, the, the glass ceiling. So we've created, with, the, with Danielle's help, 
Um, she did the bulk of the work, actually. <laughs> I just like the ideas and execution. But we created this form, this form to collect all the information for the IMGs with the hope of matching them with attending physicians who are here in the U.S., right? And it doesn't have to be very time-consuming. This is something that I really, really want to drive home to the attendant. This does not have to be time-consuming. Fran has been doing this for years. I've been doing this for years, right? It's something that is just, it's sort of almost like factory line. You know, you see them, you, you know exactly what they need because you've been there, you know, or you have friends that have been there. And you can just guide them. They're not looking for you to take them and give them a residency position. I think that might be a misconception or, or something that no one's having to address. Just, just guide them in the right direction. Sometimes they might just look for uh, an externship. Uh, they want to shadow someone. They want, you know, a, a little of recommendation. That's very basic that we can do and it could be creating immense, immense impact in these IMGs, right? And it will drive GPSF forward because if we help these people, like I think the president, Bertha, was making a, 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 a comment about how someone helped her and she's been forever indebted and so on and yeah. so forth. People don't forget these things, right? Because you give them literally an opportunity to change their life and their family's lives. So they're not gonna, they're gonna be very indebted and, and grateful. So they're gonna stay within our loving, our loving organization and it will grade our number, it will grow our numbers. And we have more fulfilling, more well-to-do physicians who are going to drive our mission forward, you know. So to have a bunch of uh, physicians sitting in a WhatsApp group who are, don't see very motivated or don't feel like GPSF is helping, it, 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 it's not helpful to our, our cause. So that's why this thing is very, I'm very passionate about. And uh, to, to the attendants who may see this uh, post-production, please sign up, please. Anything that you can give, you know, if you can just sign up, write your name and donate X amount of time, however you are, whatever works for you, we'll appreciate it. And they will too, I promise you. Awesome. I can sense the passion in your voice and I'm sitting here smiling as a proud big sis. <laughs> so thank you for taking on that initiative. I'm gonna get to the question and please feel free to ask questions either verbally, just raise your hand and I can um, um, get you on stage or if you wanna just put in the Q&A and I will ask them. So the question that is currently, and the Q&A is, why are there few URIM in academic medicine? And can you demystify academic medicine? Why should up and coming Ghanaian physicians consider academic medicine versus private practice? Great question, Maxwell. You're muted, bro. You're muted, bro. <laughs> I think you are, I think she meant, she mean, she's referring to underrepresented minorities, right? You are something, something she said. You right? are. If that's what they're referring to, then yeah, it, academic medicine has never been, has never been very, uh, how do you say it? Attractive to most folks. Why? Um, primarily because of a financial risk standpoint, right? Folks that who tend to go into the private practice world tend to make more money tend to have a better lifestyle and a better control over their academic journeys than those who are in the, than their better control over their journey, their academic, their uh, careers than those who are in academic medicine. Academic medicine is, is, is tough in its regards. It is it, good in a way because it affords you a guarantee of employment, right? So provided that you, you behave well and you work within the confines of the department's bylaws, you're going to get renewed every year, so on and so forth. You don't have to worry about finding a job next year and so on and so forth. But you also have things that you have to fulfill, right? Some research papers you have to do, or lectures, a certain amount of CMEs, and, and, and so on and so forth. And a lot of people do not want to do, deal with that. Some folks don't want to have to deal with keeping up with CMEs and traveling and going to lectures and courses and conferences and, and, and having to write research articles and so on and so forth. So that part of academic medicine may not seem very rewarding or attractive to folks. For that reason, folks will stay out of academic medicine. Um, and folks that are looking for a better lifestyle, better control will go towards private practice. Um, academic medicine, I think we need more minorities in. And this is the reason being that we don't have many of us in leadership positions. So when you come as a trainee, and Fran might attest to this too, we come as medical students and you're rotating through a whole department where you see only two black doctors, it makes it very discouraging for you to even want to aspire to go, to go into that you know, specialty. 
right? So us going and breaking these doors down and joining these programs that are historically underrepresented uh, people is good because those who come behind us who rotate these medical students and whatnot and residents will see us, they will see representation. When they go to these conferences and meetings, they will see program directors and chairs and, and so on and so forth who look like them. So mm -hmm. that makes you very encouraging that it is possible because you see somebody who looks and talks just like you in a leadership position. So that's why it's important, not only for us to get in, but for those who are to leave trails, for those who are gonna come behind us to aspire to these chairs. Absolutely. <laughs> we have in the comments, word, preach. So everything you are saying is resonating. So thank you for being the voice for others that are in agreement with what you are sharing. Um, please continue to put your questions in the chat. So my question in this environment, like in the climate that we're living in now, DEIBA, so diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, accessibility is a huge thing. How are you leveraging the focus on that to try to get more minorities and more, um, more of the different groups that are not well represented into positions within your residency program? I know, or your fellowship program. I know you mentioned that you're, you just matched with somebody that you're very, very happy about. You don't have to share, but I'm wondering, did you check that box? Did you fight for our cause? <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> It's not always easy, right? It's not always easy because the thing is, like when I applied for pain management, it wasn't a match, right? You go, it's like, you, it's like a job interview. You go on an interview, you show your credentials and they, if they like you, they have what you have to offer and then they offer you the job and you accept it. Now it's a match. So it's very tricky because there's a lot of lying that goes along, right? You see a bunch of applicants, you interview them and then you will rank them and the applicants will go on a bunch of interviews, they'll rank. And it gets thrown into a pot and the computer does its magic and then boom, you get matched. Um, so I always try to look for candidates who are very well as trained, of course, very well qualified, but minorities and women, most uh, importantly, I look for those two subgroups, minorities and women. So I'm happy and proud to say we just matched a woman um, in our program. Um, so that's very exciting. Our number one spot was a minority male and the second spot was a female. So I'm very big on that. My goal is to expand our program. Um, we, we just hired a minority of paying physician uh, also to join our group. Uh, we hired a black female practice manager. So we're trying to be as representative as representative as possible of the community that we are serving. Um, but in Miami, we I was part of the diversity, diversity and inclusion organization where they had a lot of outreach on trying to get blacks and brown students and women into apply into medical school and these medical careers and programs so um snma had a lot of those kind of pursuits as well so throughout my career i've always been sort of consciously or accidentally involved in diversity and inclusion and i think i really believe in it so i think you have you have a position in that i don't don't you and my, yeah, at CDC, yeah, absolutely. Amazing, it's that's amazing. amazing. And I think this is the fact that there's so much focus and money backing <laughs> that focus. We absolutely need to take advantage of it. And being the face and being the voice for those that will come after us. Because somebody was the voice for us before we got to our positions that we're in. Dr. Khan, uh, like, Khan, yeah, I just saw where would we be without Dr. Khan? Ago. Pardon? I saw him a couple of months ago at his uh, annual summit. Yeah. <laughs> so Dr. Khan is the um is the director of the, pro the program that yeah. Akwesi mentioned that allowed him to get a view of what med school would be like before he started. Amazing, amazing program at Rutgers University that has churned out a whole lot of amazing minority doctors. It's an right. amazing, amazing, amazing program. So we have another question in the chat. It says, what does it mean to be well qualified? Is it mostly based on the three-digit number? Or <laughs> I like that. Or you take more holistic approach. I, for one, for all those years that I've been in a position as a director, I always look at the holistic, take the holistic approach. And let me tell you why. Those numbers are literally just that, numbers, right? You can get a physician who has very great scores, 99 percentile throughout their training and cannot, for the life of themselves, like, converse with a, a goat right because there's nothing there there's no personality there's nothing they're just a shell they're just a machine 
They're just good at taking exams. So I try not to look for that because they, you need a medicine. It's, a, it's an art. You need a humanistic approach, right? So just putting somebody who's very robotic, who just knows a bunch of medical facts and figures to take care of human beings who have emotions and feelings and, and things that science can't always accurately diagnose, you know, psychosomatic medicine, which is a thing. So I always look for what are you? What, what kind of person are you? You know, are, are you, what kind of doctor are you possibly going to be? Right. If you're going to be that doctor who doesn't respect, you know, your, your patients, we fail in getting you this far. Right. We fail because we, we did not cultivate that humanistic part of you or let you know how important it is for the job or career that you, you, you're going after. So I, for one, I look at the numbers, of course, the reason being all these programs get money. Right, they get funded by Medicare and so on and so forth. And we have metrics and certain things we have to meet, right? And we get dinged on certain things, believe it or not. We get re residency review committees that come around every so often and check how many fellows we have, how many residents do we have, what are their scores, are they passing, are they retaining, are they so on and so forth. So a program looks good by having a lot of their trainees pass the boards, mm -hmm. for instance, on the first time and, and go and do multiple fellowships and so on and so forth. It looks good. We get funding, we get research monies and dollars and so on and so forth. So we look for applicants that we know have the capability of excelling and not becoming a burden, so to speak, on the program, right? We don't want a, a candidate that comes in and can't fail, pass the exam, keep failing, failing, failing. That's a like a, a, a bad mark, more or less, on the program. So we're looking for competent physicians. So for that reason, I have to look at the numbers. Right, it has to be compelling enough and say, yeah, this doctor's smart. This doctor can do the work. For instance, pain management is just one year fellowship. In that one year, you have to learn everything in pain and it's compressed and there's a lot. I mean, our textbook is like this big in one year, right? Um, and it's completely different from anything you've seen. So you have to be able to absorb that and produce it and do well and not go hurt anyone. So for that reason, yes, we look at numbers, but more so the entire applicant and what people are saying about you what do your letters say right if the letters are just like oh yeah she's okay da, 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 that's not strong but if the letters like yes i will let this doctor put me to sleep i will let this doctor cut me then sure <laughs> they hold a lot of weight awesome you all have the ear of a program director please ask your questions he has the inside scoop as we can see so make sure that you get your questions answered to that point Tell us some of your experience from the program director side. What have you seen? What are you looking for? You said the scores, you said the whole person. What advice would you give our med students, our um, young physicians that are on this um, call today? What advice would you give them to very well prepare themselves for the match process? Um, so there, there are things that you can control and there are things that you can't control. Let's start with the things that you cannot control in a way. Well, you have some control, but you can't really control it. Your scores and your numbers and so on and so forth. Once you put that stuff into the system, you can't control it. There's nothing you can do, right? I'm going to get a printout of all your information, your CV, your statements. That's beyond your control at that point because all that stuff is to me. What you can control, I think, is where you should put the majority of your energy. And that is preparation for the interview Preparation, preparing your packet, of course, most importantly, right? Making sure all your letters, don't just last, don't just ask any random person to write you a letter of recommendation. I'm going to repeat this. Do not last, do not ask any random person or any physician that you sort of just casually shadow to write you a letter of recommendation based on the, for instance, the position that they're in. It will be very apparent. It will be very transparent also when the program director or whomever reads that letter. Right. Um, for instance, I have a lot of students who may shadow with me for two weeks, three weeks, a month. But if you're coming to see me on Mondays only for a month, that's four times that I saw you. Right. So in four ac accounts, you want me to write you a, this glorious letter of recommendation. It's not going to happen. Right. And sometimes we feel bad denying you. Right. And saying, look, I'm not the one. But I think actually the best thing that I've lately doing is I let you know ahead of time, like, look, if you didn't do a good job, this is not going to be a very strong letter. I think you should find another physician that you spend more time with to write you the letter, right? Um, so ask for good letter writers. Ask them, can you please write me a positive, influential, you know, let them know that you're looking for a good, strong letter. If they can't, then they should not do it. 
right? You yourself will know who's going to be a good letter writer based on the kind of work you did with them, mm -hmm. right? So that's one. Two, have someone review your personal statement, right? Say something in there that's meaningful, not something that's very curated, very like, like if you copied it from someone. It has to be personal. Have someone look at it. Um, once you're done, if there are certain blemishes on your record, do not hide from them. Speak, don't, don't lead with that. But if it comes up, be prepared to defend or explain why that happened and how you've grown from that, right? How you've become better. We're not always looking for all stars, but what happened here, we just want to make sure you're better and you can move on. Um, when you come to the interview, before you come to the interview, do mock interviews record yourself talking, record yourself and play back and, and see what small ticks you may be doing. You might be using a lot of filler words, um, uh, mm, uh, right? You, you want to drive all those things out of your vocabulary in your, in, your, in your speech because it makes you look very unsure of yourself. You might not know that you do a lot of touching your face and a lot of like, you know, flinging your hair when you talk or especially when you're nervous. Well, recording yourself will give you an opportunity to weed some of those out and practice right um the perfect pitch is a book that if you have time you should listen to it's called the perfect pitch by dan something i can't remember the name but i'll put it in the chat so anyway, it will help you on how it teach you a lot about presenting oral speech and how to present yourself how to so on and so forth that will help a lot preparation wise um i looked at people i i loved it when we went from went back to physical because we did a lot of virtual interviews and it looks very weird Physical, I can look at you and see how you're moving. Are you, are you, how your, what's your eye contact? Are you, did you look unsure? Does it look like you're telling a lie? Is it, is it something just off? You're fidgety, you're moving, you're uncomfortable. All those body mechanisms and mannerisms you want to practice prior. Because remember, this is one of the most important interviews of your life. So you want to knock it out of the park. And sometimes you may not get a second chance to speak to this person. Right. So you want to really, really not piss them off. You don't want to say anything off color. <laughs> you don't want to make any weird off color jokes that's going to stick in your head. And finally, don't name drop. Let it come up organically. Right. If you did some research with some famous researcher at the CDC, you know, yo, you know, Fran Abanya. OK, well, don't come. Hey, Dr. Amponsa. So uh, I see you and I know Fran Abanya. I don't want to hear that at your interview. Like, no. <laughs> Let me go through your papers and say, oh, you did research at CDC. Oh, you wrote a paper with friend. Oh, by the way, do I know her? Yeah, yeah, I know her, you know? But don't lead with that, knowing, because people will look you up on Google or LinkedIn and know who you know and connections, and then they'll come into the interview with that. I had a resident recently just come into the interview <laughs> talking to me about how um, their, their uncle owns a bunch of places. Their uncle knows me, and their uncle, this is this rich guy that I know, and they led with that and that just turned me off, right? I'm like, well, like, no, I don't want you in my program because it's, it's just, no. <laughs> so don't, don't name drop with the purposes of naming drop. It's not going to do anything. It might backfire. Let it casually, organically come up. Practice, practice, practice. Get strong letters. Um, have confidence. When you walk in there, let that look him in the eye. She have a strong handshake. You know, look your best. Smile. Have that confidence that like you belong here. You 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 were given a because remember, out of a hundreds of applicants, you were given an interview. So I must be interested if I'm having you come here and talk to me in person. So have that confidence that you want me here. I'm the guy that you want. You know, I'm the girl that you, I'm a lady or a woman or whichever. Have that confidence. Let it let it speak when you sit and talk to them. You know, sit upright and don't don't look like you're stooped in and you're uncomfortable. You're nervous. And you'll do fine. Great advice. One thing you said exactly a piece of advice that I give any everybody. Once somebody has asked you to interview, they like you on paper. You just have mm -hmm. to prove to them that the person they saw on paper that they thought was good enough for the job is somebody, is that you're that person. You know, you yeah, have don't, a personality. Don't <laughs> <laughs> you have a personality, you're easy to talk to. Like they've already thought you were qualified. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in that interview. That alone should give you the confidence that you need to present yourself well at the interview. So thank right. you for saying that. Is this the book you're talking about? That, that's it right there. Perfect okay. pick. So the author is, I'll, I'll read the full title. It says Pitch Perfect, How to Say It Right the First Time Every Time. 
The author is Bill McGowan, M-C-G-O-W-A-N, and Alyssa Bowman. So thank yeah, you for correct. that recommendation. I've heard of it, but haven't read it yet. It's a great book. Um, so waiting for you all to ask questions. If you don't have any, I've got plenty. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have that's, That rhymes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so the, you mentioned the importance of getting good letters. So it's just fact that there's some scenarios where you're not able to connect with the attending as often as you. So the, the scenario that you mentioned, you've only seen them four times throughout the rotation. How do you still make an impression in those few times and those few interactions that you're able to have with attendings? How do you make a lasting impression that would allow you to at least feel confident that they can write something decent about you? If let's say you, you don't have a lot of options, like I need you to write me a letter. I need you as who you represent for your um for the hospital or whatever. So I need you to write me a letter. I, I have been interacting with you a whole lot, but I you can make an impression with just a few interactions. So to speak to that. Um a lot has to do one once you realize like listen hey i have two weeks with you you let them know once you realize you have a very small amount of time this is a, a very tricky thing that you can do but it worked very well for this student the nigerian girl that recently rotated with me she started with that she said dr amponsa um uh, my name is so and so i'm a fourth year medical student i'm applying for anesthesia um, i'm going to be here for x amount of time i really would like you to write me a letter of recommendation if I do well in the da, 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 da. and I said, okay, that's fair. You know, you know not leading with a, Hey, I need a letter from you. Would you write it? But like, Hey, suppose that I do well, would you be willing to da, 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 da? And I told her, I said, yeah, well, let, you know, let's see how things go. Right. So at least she put that in my head. I like, look, I'm coming here with a purpose. I want to do well. I want to show you I'm working hard. And then once you let them know that, Hey, this is your purpose. And you know, you want to, you're interested in this and you're going into this field and you really, really will mean a lot if they got a letter. So you are coming to work because you want to get something. Show up on time. Show up before the rest of your classmates or, 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 or you know, students or whatever. Show up there. Show up not only on time, but show up prepared. Mm -hmm. Right? Show up prepared. Read ahead of time what we're going to be talking about or what we're going to be discussing for the day. Or whichever patients we're going to see, if you get a chance, go through your chart the day before so that you know what kind of things are going to come up. So when I ask you certain questions, you know what I'm talking about, or you can have the very educated answers. Um, you know, when you should there, be proactive. If you're seeing patients, don't sit there and always be spoon fed. Hey, do you want to go see this patient? Hey, do you want to go see? No, you get up. Can I see this patient? You go to who's next? Who's next? Um, especially in the outpatient setting, right? Um, if you're an inpatient, you're checking on the patient, you chart checking, you're checking to see if their labs are come back. Um, you're speaking with the nurses with respect. You're speaking with the patients with respect. You're checking on their patients, your bedside manner, speak volumes. Because sometimes a patient might be your best advocate when you're not there. A patient might, your attendant might go into the room and, a patient, and that patient might tell them, yo, that doctor, so, so, so. And you might be a student. They might be calling you doctor. That is a big resounding, oh, you must be doing something right. The nurses might be your advocate. Oh, this patient, this student is very blah, blah, blah. blah you know, above and beyond, they come in and asking these questions, they follow up on this and this and that, they versus, oh, that student is very rude. Because you have students who will be very rude to the nurses and ancillary staff and be very respectful to their attendants. It'll get back to them, mm -hmm. right? So be very cautious who you interact with, um, show up on time and offer to do a little bit more, right? At the end of your rotation, offer to do a presentation. Offer, don't, be, don't wait to be asked. Offer to do a five, 10 minute talk on something you saw, right? If you see something very compelling, offer to write it up. A case report is very easy. Offer something like that. You'll get a letter and a case report out of that, yeah. right? Offer the chance to possibly work with them at a longer time in the near future, if, if available. You know, let them know that, hey, I recognize that two weeks is not enough. Perhaps I could come back for another two weeks next year, you know? So I think those things will let, a person know that, man, this person is really serious and they deserve a letter. Awesome. So I heard you say, show initiative, be intentional, be prepared, mm -hmm. do well, and stand out. So those that's are the right. things that I got from what you said. And that's a great, great, great advice. Yes. Let's go back to your career. You've climbed mm -hmm. the ranks in a short period of time. 
there's a few young attendings on the call today. Share with them any advice that you would have for them to be able to get into these leadership positions and set themselves up well to be seen, right? Again, we need to take advantage of this climate where DEIRA is, DEIRBA is very, very prominent. So how does one a young position early in their career set themselves up for these higher level positions down the line? Um, I think the first thing is you have to have the interest for it, right? Uh, you have to have the interest for it. Otherwise, it will seem like too arduous. It seems too much work and then you will eventually give up. If you genuinely have the interest for it, the driver is just auto, you're on autopilot, right? And then you have to be willing to work hard. You have to be willing to want to, want to do the work. Because these positions, the reason why a lot of people shy from them is because it's, it entails a certain amount of work, right? Outside of your clinical practice or clinical scope of practice, right? Like for now, I have every Wednesday off as my dedicated admin time where I'm in my office doing emails and making lectures and PowerPoints and so on and so forth. So you have to be willing to want to do the work that comes with the position, not just to have the title, just to have power and influence or whatever, but you want to really do work that's going to make a meaningful change if you think you can do you can drive your department in a better direction because you firmly really believe in it then go for that position because you know you can make that impact right if you think there are not enough black women in your hospital you well become that dio or dir that person because you really believe that you can make change right rather than sit there and complain that there's not enough of you you will get in there and open the door right um so you have to really be interested. You have to be willing want to do the work. You have to be, of course, have the credentials and the, the expertise. But one thing, too, is to find a mentor in that space. Mm -hmm. That's very, very important. I can under, underscore that. If you want to go that direction, find someone who's already been that direction. It'll make your life a lot easier. Because unfortunately or unfortunately, there's some degree of politics and bureaucracy that comes with academic medicine. Mm -hmm. And to be able to navigate that, sometimes you need someone who's been through those peaks and troughs and can say, hey, uh, watch out for this or watch out for that person <laughs> and, you know, it'll make your life easier. So finding a mentor in that space will also be very instrumental. Thank you. took the next question right out of my mouth. The importance of a mentor. I don't mm. think any of us could have gotten where we are without a mentor. Somebody that paved the path before, someone that's been there, done that. Um, I also think it's important to have sponsors. The difference between a mentor and a sponsor. A sponsor is someone who's like putting your name out there, like, oh yes, Aqua C is an amazing person. He'll be perfect for this position. So when when you're not in the room, they're speaking on your behalf. They're mm -hmm. working in the background to get you to your next level. So mentors, sponsors, coaches, all are very very important in your career journey. So let me ask you, how have you found your mentors or how have your mentors found you? Because it works both ways sometimes. <laughs> See, that is very key. That's what you, I'm glad you said that the last part works both ways. So I I, I, I think there's a, a mentor, a sponsor, and an imposter, <laughs> okay, or a faker. There are certain people who are just having a mentor. The mentor has to go both ways. The mentorship, mentee, mentor relationship has to be both ways. You have to be mutually yoked, right? Mm -hmm. Both people have to have the interest in making sure both there's usually mutually mutual growth, or at least they really genuinely want you to do well, right? The reason being, I've had in my personal experience, people who I consider to be my mentors who were not great mentors at all, right? They have the title, you, you look up to them, you idolize them in some way, which is not healthy, right? But you just want to be in a position they are, or you they don't think that you, would, you aspire to do, you admire and you, you're hoping that by knowing them, by working with them, they could teach you the ropes. And some of these people won't, you know, they're just kind of using you for whichever, whatever. And you have to be able to identify those people and get that out of your time and space so you can be more efficient and take your resources elsewhere. It's critical that you find a mentor. You can get there by yourself. You can absolutely do it on your own. Just your life is be much easier and you can avoid certain pitfalls by having a mentor who's already been there, right? I've aggressively sought out mentors and they don't have to be people I know. They could be a distant person that I'm just watching, right? We have access to all these people's lives with our smartphones on Instagram, Facebook. We know what they're doing. We know what moves they're making. They announce all their deals. They announce, you know, so you can find mentors who are in the spaces you want to go 
if you want to be a, a podcaster. Well, need makes like a million podcasts a night. Watch him do it, right? Watch him do it. And you you know, you don't have to know him personally. You don't have to have a cell phone. Just ask him a question, DM him, right? If you see you know anyone doing something that you admire, you can just go reach them and approach them. And sometimes people feel flattered that you even uh, uh, you know identify, uh, acknowledge what they're doing so much so that you want to emulate them. Yeah. And that they will give you the gems. Right. So you have to aggressively go out there. Nobody's going to come and pick you and say, hey, you look like you remind me of me 10 years ago. So come on, let me <laughs> come with me. No. Right. You have to go seek after them and then pick the right ones for you. Nice. I like that answer. The importance of mentors, the imposter piece. That's funny to me. <laughs> It's true. And, and sometimes Very it's heartbreaking thing. because you spend years thinking these people are your mentors and you want them to da da da. But it's like, like for instance, I have one person that I, I really look up to, you know, I look up to a lot and, and they're doing great and, I, and they have an amazing career. And I always ask them for, because I, I, I trust their, their, their judgment. But a lot of times when you're asking for questions, you're asking questions and seeking information and seeking guidance. And they just like, you know, nowhere to be found or they, they blow you off or like, you know, like won't call you back or won't respond. Or, and you're like, yo, 10 years I've been following this guy around. Why am I calling this guy my mentor? And when they're not, you know, <laughs> well, well, by you, somebody else you have met, met six months ago could be giving you very important things, you know, so. Right. So what I hear is it's important to have more than one mentor. Absolutely. Um, not only because of time availability, but just the different information that you can gain from different individuals. So don't feel like you're limited to one person. There may be multiple people that you can connect with, especially as physicians. We are very time limited, right? So it's very important to try to not overwhelm one person, tap into different Absolutely. individuals. Then that gets a little exhausted. Exactly. And it's not what are you? I'm waiting to hear from the audience. Any other questions? Let me know if you want me to take time. They listen, they listen to the, the, the amazing questions you have. <laughs> oh, I don't want to miss, let you, I don't want you all to miss out on this opportunity. Again, it's the program director. This is an entrepreneur. This is somebody that is doing big things. So another thing I can say to the IMGs is when you're applying for your programs, you know, always have a, a backup, which, which is odd that I say that because I'm the kind of guy that's, or 100% plan A, just go for it, Hail Mary, get plan B. But when you're applying, because of the nature of the beast, you got to have a plan B. For instance, if you want to go to internal medicine, but your scores are not the greatest or whatever, you know there's some issue there. Apply for family medicine also, right? Because guess what? You might not match in medicine, internal medicine, but you might match in family. Well, you can do one or two years of family medicine and sneak your way through the back door into an internal medicine program perhaps in the same hospital, in the same institution, or through somebody you know, or there's a person that drops out or, or a spot becomes available while you're training, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, or you might become a family medicine attendant and then apply, but then they will, you look highly qualified because you're already an attendant. So always in your situation, have a plan B. If you want to go into neurosurgery, but the odds are highly against you, still go for it without a doubt. But if you try one, two, and it's not working, maybe you need to try neurology and maybe do two years of neurology before you backdoor your way into neurosurgery, you know? So if one door you keep knocking and it's not open and you put all your energy to break that door down, there might be a back door open, go through there. You're still in the house. Yeah. Yeah. And family medicine doctors actually can do many of the same things as internal medicine doctors. My cousin... Right did a residency in family medicine. He's a hospitalist, right? So there's definitely opportunities to do beyond just what you um, complete your residency in. And a lot of times too, a lot of the FMGs also end up lucking out because when they finish, they have to go work in these, you know, these areas which are not very like uh, popular to American graduates. But those areas are so in need of physicians that they are willing to pay a lot of money. So I know hospitalists who are working in these remote areas and rural areas who are, working like two weeks on, two weeks off for like quarter million. I mean, they, these guys are making very significant amount of money for a very little amount of time, you know? So keep, 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 keep pushing guys. Absolutely. So we have a comment. Kofi says, or if you're really passionate about family medicine, also have an IM as a backup. So it can work both ways. Absolutely. It can go both ways. <laughs> However, the, wherever the passion lies, the question is, 
the answer is or the trick is just have a back door. Absolutely. Don't give up. All right, I'm gonna give a few seconds. We're almost at the top of the hour. Mm, wow, time flies. Yeah, right, time does fly. Great conversation. I really enjoyed my time with you. Um, any last minute questions? Going once, going twice. All mm. right, thank you all for your attention. I hope you guys have enjoyed the conversation. Or, or put in a group. Pardon? I said you can always put some questions after the thoughts in the uh, WhatsApp group or... Yes, absolutely. But tell us how can they get in contact with you? If somebody wants to reach out to you, ask your advice, figure out what their next steps should be, have you as a mentor maybe, <laughs> how can folks get in contact with you? I'll put my email in the group chat. Beautiful. And that's, I, I check my email twice a day. So I should be able to get stuff. Good, good, good. Awesome. So we have a comment in the um in the chat says so insightful. Thanks so much. Awesome. So we're getting a lot of good feedback. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Guys, thanks for spending your evening with me. Yes. So again, thank you all for being here. A special, special thank you, Style and Doc, for being with us here. Continue to do great things. It was such a pleasure. And we look forward to hearing more of the great things that you'll do. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Fran, thanks so much and have a good evening and I'll be speaking with you soon. Yes, sir. Take care, everybody. All right, guys. Good night.